just started now hello everyone so um, back again with the medicine questions and um, <coughs> um, so this is the November 2021 recall questions that I've collected and as always uh, before I start my session um, the important point to mention is that um, recalls need not always be accurate and um, obviously uh, since I have not given the exam I'm totally dependent on the questions that have been sent to me and based on the recalls obviously when one choice changes or one word changes um, the questions answer is going to definitely change so keep that in mind and keep these um, videos as a learning process let's just focus on understanding the concept rather than go too much into detail about the exact uh, choices and uh, there will always be uh, vari variation in the opinion of some students as to what they really thought it, uh, that came in the exam so however um, any question that you think any choices that you feel uh, need to be modified do let me know um, just give me a sec let me just get the uh, chat working here just give me one second please right so starting with the first question so this is uh, the basics of um, cardiology so what i found in the questions this time was that um, i thought there were some questions that had a lot of numericals and i thought the numericals were a little tough uh, they had asked a few questions from the very recent updates that had come in 2021 this year um, so numbers uh, numericals data i think these were uh, some of the unfortunate problems that were there this year but other than that uh, almost 80 percent of the questions were concept based and i think much of these we have already discussed in our classes so those of you who are um, able to do these concepts should not have had any problems in answering these questions So as far as the first question is concerned, in JVP, which of the following coincides with the isovolumetric contraction phase of the heart? So as we've discussed in the classes, um, the JVP gives a good idea about what is happening in the right heart and the, it looks at the right heart pressures. So to give you a simple diagram, this is the right atrium, the right ventricle and the pulmonary artery. So we know that initially what happens is the atrial contraction and uh, the three important waves A, C, B are the positive waves in JVP. The X, X dash and Y, these are the negative waves. Okay, X, X dash and Y. Sorry. Right. So, um, so what I was trying to tell you was that when the atria contracts, then what you get is the A wave. Okay, when the atrial contraction happens, this is the A wave. Moment the atrial contraction finishes, the ventricular contraction starts. And as the atria finishes the atrial contraction, the A wave that has occurred, as the atria starts relaxing, you'll notice that the next step is going to be ventricular contraction. And the very relaxation of the atria itself is going to result in the very early negative wave that starts and this is the early part of x descent that we talk about once the ventricle starts contracting the first thing it will do is close the tricuspid valve and remember at this point the pulmonary valve is yet to open so at this point both the valves are closed and this is what we refer to as the isovolumetric contraction phase this is the beginning of the isovolumetric contraction this is the point where the rv starts building up the pressure it is yet to overcome the pressure to overcome the pulmonary artery at this point as the rv pressure starts to rise because the pressure on the right atrium don't forget the right atrial pressures are somewhere between 0 to 8 or 0 to 9. So this is because as the right atrial finishes contraction and it goes into relaxation, the pressure in the right atrium goes close to 0. So when the right ventricle starts its contraction, notice that the pressure across the tricuspid valve is much lower compared to the pressure across the pulmonary valve. For this reason, the initial thing that happens is the tricuspid bulge. Okay. So one of the early features you will see in a ventricular contraction is tricuspid bulge and this coincides with the isovolumetric contraction. This tricuspid bulge is picked up as the C wave in the JVP. This is what is picked up as the C wave in the JVP. So we covered this uh, at length and obviously to finish it off now, the X dash is continuation of ventricular contraction as it pulls the atrial wall down and the V wave is the atrial filling and the venous filling of the right atrium. That is what we refer to as the V wave. So 
to summarize it over here, A is the atrial contraction, which I'm sure all of you are aware. X descent that happens mainly is because when ventricle contracts, it pulls the atrial wall inside. And as it pulls the atrial wall inside, this is going to expand the atria. That's the reason why you get the major part of the X descent. When the ventricle is contracting, the tricuspid valve is closed. It continues to fill the blood in the right atrium. And this is the reason why you're getting the V wave. And ultimately, when the valves open, the emptying of the atria into the ventricle results in the Y descent. So we've covered these at length in our classes and this is the same thing that that I have um, you know covered in the classes and this is what you can see from my notes now important point is ki we've uh, just discussed this idea that a is atrial contraction i told you it touches a peak of around eight millimeter mercury during atrial contraction atria starts relaxing this is the initial relaxation that results in the initial part of x descent c wave is the ventricular contraction that's when the ventricle contracts so you should know s1 starts over here this is when the ventricle begins to contract the initial part is isovolumetric contraction that's when you get the bulge of the tricuspid this is coordinated with the c wave then the tricuspid valve closes so this is the sequence that i'm just showing over here and this sequence gives you an idea about how sorry about this right so this gives you an idea about what are the waves that occur and what are the sequence um that you'll see just give me one second please yes right Okay, so I think this is a pretty easy question. So we'll just go ahead with that. So it was, it's pretty straightforward. The first question was the isovolumetric contraction occurs coinciding with the C wave. Which congenital heart disease has saturation? Which congenital heart disease has a saturation in uh, which is equal in all four chambers of the heart? So I think this again, we've covered in the congenital heart disease section. So in these, it's very simple idea to understand that when you're looking at all chambers having equal saturation the mixing should occur in the right atrium itself whatever blood is collected in the right atrium that mixed blood should be going from right atrium to the other chambers and if mixing happened before before it comes the blood comes to the right atrium then naturally it's that same blood that goes in all the four chambers so the easy way to put it is key when you look at the total anomalous pulmonary venous drainage you can understand normally first of all when you're looking at the anomalous pulmonary venous drainage before I discuss about this, just want to cover an important idea over here that okay, you have the SVC, IVC draining into the right atrium. This blood enters the right ventricle. Right ventricle blood enters the lung. From the lung, the blood should have entered into the left atrium. So this is what is normal process. Now what is happening in patients with anomalous pulmonary venous drainage, as the name itself is suggesting, that the pulmonary veins, instead of opening the left atrium, are coming back and opening inside the right heart. The most common type of total anomalous pulmonary venous drainage, as you all must be aware, is the supracardiac type. So in this, what happens is that the oxygenated blood from the lung enters back in the, into the pulmonary, in the in the right heart into the right atrium and because it enters back inside the right atrium it's already mixed blood and this blood that is already mixed from the lung blood plus the venous blood that is coming from svc ivc is already mixed in the right atrium this mixed blood enters through the patent foramen ovale into the left atrium and enters left heart and this same blood enters the right ventricle notice then because mixing is happening in the right atrium is the same blood that is going in the left atrium the right ventricle and in the left ventricle as well so this is the reason why you'll find that the saturations are equal in all of these four chambers so So if you look at this image, you'll find that the pulmonary veins that are there, the four pulmonary veins are forming a common uh, unit, unit behind and then they are draining into the um, superior, In the, this is the supracardiac type and you can see it much more clear over here. There's a common confluence of the four pulmonary veins and these four pulmonary veins are going through the vertical vein, coming through the nominate and then draining in the superior vena cava. So because the mixing is happening in the right atrium itself, this mixed blood, that is the venous blood plus the oxygenated blood from the lung is all getting mixed in the right atrium and it is this right atrial blood that is entering the left atrium, it is entering the right ventricle, ultimately this is the same blood that is coming in the left ventricle. So note the saturations in all of them are going to be equal and this is the reason why they have asked this question so this is uh, if you know the way how the blood drain happens in each of these conditions uh, then it will be very easy to understand as to what condition will come with equal saturation so actually saturation is something that we don't discuss much at the post mvbs level this is more of a specialty question but i think the logic was very 
um, you know, aptly tested. And the concept that if you had understood how the congenital heart disease, uh, you know, the various drainages and happens and I mean, how all the uh, other types of congenital heart disease, where the shunts are, if you have an idea about this, then this question is very easy to answer. So to summarize once again, TAPVC has been asked multiple times in the past also and uh, last year also I think they had a, had a question and that was about uh, how the x-ray findings are and the x-ray finding as you know is the snowman's appearance that you see in patients with total anomalous pulmonary venous drainage. So this is the x-ray that I was telling you. This was uh, what was asked last INICT, I think. So they are they are testing congenital heart disease. Almost every um, AIMS, uh, INICT, they are, they are asking one question on congenital heart disease. So it's very important to have a general idea about what the sanitary conditions are, what the asanitary conditions are, uh, in what direction the blood is flowing, uh, what is the embryology behind each of these conditions. All these things we have discussed at length in our classes. Which of the following causes hypokalemia with metabolic alkalosis and hypertension? So uh, whenever you see these uh, channelopathies that they ask in renal, uh, broad concept you should have in what conditions you'll get hypertension and in what conditions you will not get hypertension. So first of all, very easy to tell that Bata syndrome is something that they've been repeatedly asked in our exam and I'm sure you all know that this is a condition where the blood pressure is considered to be normal. Okay, so this doesn't come with hypertension, this is normal blood pressure. When you're able to eliminate one uh, option, then I think it becomes the things become much more easier after that. So now you're looking at possibilities of Little syndrome, Gentleman syndrome and Gordon syndrome. Once you understand about Gittleman and Gordon, Gittleman and Gordon basically are opposite to each other. You know the same channels are affected. Only thing is the channels are working opposite. One is hyperfunctioning of a channel, one is hypofunctioning of a channel. So I'll just show you what those are. But Gittleman and Gordon's are basically simple idea to remember is that whatever happens in Gittleman's, the opposite is happening in Gordon's syndrome. But let's look at what first what is Little's syndrome. So as we've covered in the classes, uh, I'm showing the same diagram, but if you want, I can explain it again. So when looking at okay, the rough schematic diagram, just to explain about what, what the events are that are happening in patients with Little syndrome. So in Little syndrome, what happens is the ENAC channel that is there, which is actually to some extent activated by the aldosterone normally, that is hyperfunctioning. The ENAC channel that is there, as you know, in the distal tubule, in the distal tubule, the aldosterone acts on the receptor and activates two important channels to form. One is the epithelial sodium channel and the others are and this is the vascular side on the vascular side you have the sodium potassium pumps the sodium potassium counter pumps so basically the sodium is getting pumped back in the blood it this is happening via the activation of aldosterone aldosterone acts on the receptor that controls the genes the genes are coding for the channels and the channels that the main work that they do is get the sodium back from the urine okay this is the luminal side and that is the capillary side. So basically, it's the reabsorption of sodium that is controlled by these channels. Now, what happens is in this condition, in patients with Little syndrome, the pathology is not with aldosterone, not with the receptor, not at the gene level. It's the ENAC channel, and there is a problem in the degradation of the ENAC channel. This ENAC channel does not get degraded. Excess excessive activity of the ENAC channel starts occurring, and what it does that means is it starts reabsorbing excessive sodium from the urine back into the vascular system so if excessive sodium is getting reabsorbed excessive sodium is getting reabsorbed then naturally hypertension is going to be a long-term complication of this condition as you know every positive charge that is reabsorbed to maintain the ionic balance either a potassium or a h plus has to be lost that's how the ionic balance is maintained in the distal tubule so every positive charge that is reabsorbed is countered by a loss in positive charge and this is the reason why you will see these patients coming with hypokalemia and metabolic alkalosis so to summarize what are the things that happen in patient little syndrome you will see patients coming with polyuria you will see that these patients will have high blood pressures they will have loss of potassium so they'll have hypokalemia because they lose h plus they'll have metabolic alkalosis the high pressures are going to buy feedback suppress renin 
and aldosterone and these are also tested in our exam that this is a condition that is basically what is referred to as pseudo hyper aldosteronemic condition pseudo anything following pseudo is false as you know so when you say pseudo hyper aldo it's not really high, high aldosterone it is low aldosterone all the features look as if they are the aldosterone is high but actually aldosterone is not high over here it's a channel that is hyper functioning so this is in brief about what is happening in patients with little syndrome now if you look at the gentleman syndrome it's very easy from there to understand what is happening in gordon syndrome so just i'll explain to you what is gentleman then you just follow from there what's going to happen in gordon's in the distal tubule, you know, there are channels where thiazides will work. The mechanism or the place of action of thiazides in the distal tubule is via these channels. We know that there are sodium chloride channels that are playing a role. And this is where the thiazide drug works. And these channels are working together with another very important channel here this is referred to as the trp m6 and this is the main defect in patients with gentleman so this condition kind of behaves like like thiazide as if the patient is taking chronic thiazide so what happens over here is that the sodium is not reabsorbed and this causes the loss of sodium to pull water down into, into the urine and this is going to result in again polyuria now what happens is this sodium comes further down and the enac channel is waiting so some sodium is reabsorbed and that is countered that negative charge is countered by a loss of potassium so you will see in this patients then in gentleman's that there is hypokalemia there is metabolic alkalosis. The reason for hypokalemic alkalosis is simply again because sodium gets reabsorbed further downstream with a loss of potassium. Okay, with a loss of potassium and H+. So you do see metabolic alkalosis here just like Barter's. You do see hypokalemia here. You do see the blood pressure is maintained in normal range. These patients come with polyuria. Okay, one with major one big difference that is there between gentlemen's and patients with Barter's is these patients are going to have very high loss of magnesium. Okay, because these channels TRP M6 is connected with magnesium reabsorption. So since magnesium reabsorption is not occurring, you do see loss of magnesium. And this loss of magnesium is going to be um, in the long term associated with hypocalcemia, hypocalcemia. And I've seen students get confused between Barton's and gentlemen's. And uh, the, the, the wrong logic is that Barton's is a condition that comes with high urine calcium. They come with renal stones. Why is the serum calcium normal in Barton's? The thing to understand is that the serum calcium is controlled mainly by parathormone. The bone has got a huge reserve for calcium. And as long as parathormone is functioning, you will not see a hypocalcemic state occurring inside the body in Barter syndrome. So the point that I'm trying to tell you is that Barter gentleman, one of the major differences is that comes with high calcium in the urine, that is hypercalciuria. But the trick, the trick they play in the MCQ, they are, the question that they ask in the exam is not about urine calcium. Everybody knows urine calcium is high in butter, not in gentleman. In gentleman, you will actually see the urine calcium is low. Just like thiazide, we give thiazide to prevent urine calcium excretion. Remember, calcium is basically reabsorbed in the thick ascending loop of Henle along with sodium, right? So the urine calcium in this condition actually is low. Now, the point that you need to understand here is key. Because magnesium is low, this magnesium has a role in the parathyroid gland and it controls the release and formation of parathormone. The chronic hypomagnesemia that results causes hypoparathyroidism and this is the reason why you will see urine, I mean, uh, serum calcium can be low in patients with gentleman. So this is another question actually that I just wanted to highlight as I was discussing this. Um, remember between the two Barters and gentlemen who come with hypocalcemia, that's a question they ask in the exam. It's not about hypo, hypo or hypercalciuria, that is clear to everybody. More calcium in the urine in Barters, less calcium in the urine in gentlemen. Just like Barters like frosomite and gentlemen like thiazide. So that's straightforward. But what they're asking is serum calcium. Many students have this logic if you, you there is calcium loss in the urine in Barters, serum calcium must be low that's not true butters calcium is maintained by multiple feedback circuits whereas in gentleman the the serum calcium will be low the reason why serum calcium is low in gentleman is because magnesium is low and magnesium is required for the formation and release of parathormone so this is an important concept to remember anyway this is about gentleman now whatever we saw in gentleman just the opposite you have to apply for for Gordon syndrome. So this is what we've covered in our classes. So this is gentlemen, I'll just zoom in. 
you can see as i was telling you that this is the trp m6 channels that are defective in gentleman the sodium chloride channels are linked with that as they are defective magnesium is not reabsorbed sodium chloride also is not reabsorbed so patient is going to have all these features in gentleman there is urine magnesium loss there is decreased urine calcium the reason why urine calcium is low as i told you is when there is sodium loss happening in the um, in in this uh, distal tubule over here proximal tubule thick ascending loop of la sorry will reabsorb more sodium along with that more calcium is reabsorbed so calcium is actually controlled along with sodium it goes along with sodium and as sodium is reabsorbed in the thick ascending loop of la more calcium is reabsorbed if sodium is not reabsorbed calcium is not reabsorbed okay so basically you need to have this idea that thick ascending loop of la calcium sodium pumps go together they work in the same direction anyway coming back over here the, this is a condition with high urine magnesium low urine calcium hypokalemic alkalosis and this patient generally tend to have a normal blood pressure this is because there is no retention of sodium there is a channel which is not reabsorbing sodium loss of sodium in the urine if the body sodium starts decreasing you cannot get hypertension so gentleman's is another condition that will not come with hypertension our mcq was telling hypertension so gentleman's ruled out barter's ruled out these two are definitely out now you might say what about what about gordons sorry Okay, so this is Gordon syndrome. Now, this is a defect in the WNK gene. Now, what happens over here is kind of the opposite of what we just saw in patients with gentleman. Gentleman, the TRP M6 channels were not working. The sodium chloride was not getting reabsorbed. The opposite happens here. These channels start hyperfunctioning. If there is excessive reabsorption of sodium and chloride, then this is going to result in the opposite. You will see hyperkalemia over here. So remember, in gentleman we saw hypokalemia. Here we see hyperkalemia. There we saw metabolic alkalosis. Here you will see metabolic acidosis. There we saw low urine calcium. Here you see high urine calcium. More or less, what you notice is whatever you saw in gentleman, put the opposite things in Gordon's. Gordon's is also referred to as pseudo hypoaldosteronism type one, type two. Sorry, okay, this is wrong. This is type two. It is pseudo hypoaldosteronism type two. So the treatment in um, these conditions um, is particularly in gentleman's is thiazides. Even in Gordon's is. Is thiazides in gentleman's the treatment sorry is um, uh, the electrolyte correction uh, fluid uh, you know uh, salt and fluids and sodium potassium corrections are basically what we do for both batters and gentleman's whereas for gardens the treatment is going to be thiazides okay so to come back to the question that they ask in the exam when you see hypokalemia, then rule out Gordon's. Gordon's comes with hyperkalemia. If they say hypertension, then rule out gentleman and barter. Both gentleman and barter come with normal blood pressure. Okay, normal to low blood pressure. So among these conditions, the one that comes with hypertension is Littles. Yes, even Gordon's comes with hypertension, but the difference is Gordon's comes with hyperkalemia, not hypokalemia. To summarize then in a very simplified way, remember whatever you see in like furosemide, whatever you get, kind of what you get in Barter syndrome. What you would get in patients with thiazide is what you get in patients with gentleman. If you remember gentleman like an anchor point, then you can understand everything what you get in gentleman. The opposite of that will happen in Gordon because the channels hyperfunction in Gordon's. In Gentlemen, the channels are hypo hypo functioning. So this is the reason why the answer here is little syndrome. Okay, so somebody is telling that in this question, the um, congenital heart disease has equal pressure. Now, such a question is just not possible because equal pressure does not occur in any of these. In all four chambers, doesn't occur in any of these conditions. Okay, so there was there is somebody who is putting forward the thing that it was not equal saturation, but equal pressure is just not possible. It doesn't occur in any of these four conditions, which means if they're asking equal pressure, it might be some other condition. Definitely not these four. Which of the following? Which of the following is the preferred drug in the treatment of primary progressive multiple sclerosis? Now, we know that when they ask about multiple sclerosis, generally we all think about the relapsing remitting type of multiple sclerosis. And this we've discussed in the classes at length about the various concepts in multiple sclerosis. Remember that for many, many years, we always struggled about primary progressive multiple sclerosis. In fact, if you remember the older editions of Harrison, they had given us totally separate follow flow chart for primary progressive multiple sclerosis because the typical drugs like interferon beta, I mean, except for interferon beta, most of the other drugs would not work in primary progressive multiple sclerosis. So this is the reason why they have asked. And uh, of about a few years back, um, it was a breakthrough where they found this drug, osirlizumab, which is uh, anti-CD20. Um, 
having efficacy in primary progress of multiple sclerosis and it was a big deal for almost i think from past 4 years uh, it's been almost 4 years now that this breakthrough has happened and uh, from past 4 years we are emphasizing in the class this will come this will come this will come finally they asked now ultimately but um, but this is the main drug that we that is now approved in the management of patients with primary progressive multiple sclerosis alemtuzumab is basically anti cd52 uh, natalizumab as you know is a very effective drug in relapsing remitting type of multiple sclerosis so if you look at the summary points that i have given in my notes i have distilled out all the high you know the recent guidelines and uh, one of the problems that you find in harrison is ki harrison is not textbook of medicine it's principles of medicine very good for concepts but unfortunately not that good for treatment uh, when it comes to treatment books like current medical diagnosis are better either way aims inict particularly is testing the more recent um, you know uh, guidelines so you should be aware of uh, for neat you don't have to worry but for inict definitely recent guidelines become very very important now if you look at a summary that i've given for patients with um, multiple sclerosis if you you want to use a safe drug but the patient has mild disease does not have uh, poor prognostic factors then what we generally prefer are these drugs and if the patient has got um, we want a high efficacy drug we want a big gun in the sense the patient has got spinal cord disease patient is older age we know that risk factors are higher then in those conditions we are going to go for natalizumab so these are the drugs that we choose the choice of the drugs simple idea that i have given over here is just um, you know what to choose if you want more stronger drug or more weaker drug two things to look at one is the efficacy one is the safety profile if you the question is asking which is the safest drug among all these the answer is glatrimer okay glatrimer is generally considered to be the safest and generally that is what is started in most patients if it doesn't work then if the patient has got more you know um significant features the big gun that we talk about that if you if the glatrimer is not working then the drug that we are going to introduce is going to be natalizumab Okay, first line for all purpose for relapsing remitting generally is dimethylphenidate. The reason is advantage of dimethylphenidate compared to glatrimer is dimethylphenidate is oral drug. Okay, you know fingolimod, dimethylphenidate, tyrophenam, all these are oral drugs. So DMF particularly is a rising star. It's quite effective. It's safe. Safety profile also is good. So this is the reason why generally dimethylphenidate is generally the oral drug that we go to in most patients with relapsing remitting multiple sclerosis. However, if the MCQ says which is the safest, the answer is glatrimer. Okay, but glatrimer is not oral. If MCQ says primary progressive multiple sclerosis, as I've covered in my in our notes, the answer is oseralizumab. Okay, so primary progressive, don't forget it is oseralizumab. So these are the other features that we have covered in multiple sclerosis in our notes. So you can see what is um, what is primary progressive multiple sclerosis. It basically is about ten to fifteen percent of cases. Uh, the patient should have progressive neurological manifestations for more than a year to come into this criteria. the the other feature that help us decide how to choose the drug is is the patient having poor prognostic markers or is not having poor prognostic markers based on that also we decide whether to choose a drug that is safe but low efficacy or whether to choose a more stronger drug although it might have more side effects so all the decision of what choice of drug that we use depend on all these things anyway in the post mbbs level uh, we have not seen too much at length about the choice of drug and the algorithms that are there now as to how to choose the treatment however since primary progressive multiple sclerosis was always a headache the treatment charts were totally different even in harrison if you see two different charts they have given for treatment for relapsing remitting and primary progressive ms the primary progressive ms for many years had no treatment we were trying many thing the efficacy was very poor the mortality rates were high the disease was progressing the only drug ultimately that came as a big relief was oseralizumab this is the reason why we emphasize so much about this drug in our classes because this is something like a breakthrough it's come now recently and it is a big deal now because this seems to be one of the main drugs that is working in primary progressive multiple sclerosis hypoxemia with normal alveolar arterial gradient is seen in which of the following so when you look at the um, oxygen transfers when you're looking at um, this uh, concept in fact in the physio part of respiratory system before we start the pulmonology section we go into a uh, good amount of uh, detail in the concept part and you can see um the broad idea is we start and this i think this is one of the videos that i've even put up in youtube for those who are interested in seeing um so this is the formula that you should be aware of the partial pressure of alveolar oxygen 
is nothing but FiO2 into atmospheric pressure minus whatever pressure minus PSU2 divided by R. Now, you don't need to really remember this formula um, uh, for NEAT, I think, but INICT has tested this concept. And um, earlier, we used to have separate exam for Ames and Jipmer. Um, this hot favorite Jipmer question, they used to always ask about the calculation for pulmonary alveolar oxygen. And once you get alveolar oxygen, arterial oxygen is given in the ABG. So you have to take that and do the calculation. So this is basically alveolar arterial oxygen gradient. Now, the concept that you need to understand here is when you're looking at partial pressure of alveolar oxygen this is the partial pressure that is there of oxygen inside the alveoli this obviously we are calculating and I the formula that I showed you is how we calculate the alveolar oxygen arterial oxygen you know we can get it through the arterial blood gas analysis the gap between these is what they are asking in the exam now this is very very logical you can only tell that if there is any pathology in the alveolar membrane, naturally the diffusion of the gas will not occur. This is going to create a gradient. So arterial oxygen is going to be low, alveolar oxygen is going to be high. It will start creating a gap. If you find a VQ mismatch, if you find a shunt, a shunt in the sense that you are finding that some alveoli perfusion is in some alveoli, the ventilation is not occurring, but perfusion occurs. As ventilation not occurring, perfusion is occurring, that means there's no gas transfer happening over here. This again is going to result, don't forget this alveolar oxygen is what we are calculating based on the inspired oxygen that we have. So inspired oxygen will not change. So basically you're calculating your PO2 from there, alveolar oxygen from there. The arterial oxygen is going to suffer because a large chunk of area where oxygenation should have occurred, that's not occurring. So ventilation absent, perfusion present is what we refer to the shunt phenomena. So in shunt, in VQ mismatch, in all these conditions, you will see that the patient is going to have a decrease in arterial oxygen. But when you're talking about the gap, imagine if a patient does not have any disease over here, any disease in the alveolar arterial oxygen gradient. But if there is a pathology that results in hypoventilation, since there's no problem between the alveolar and the artery, they will equilibrate very nicely and there's no problem. It's just simply hypoventilation. And I've seen students ask me this idea can you explain this using the formula? Yeah, even using the formula, I can explain with that how alveolar arterial oxygen gradient can be normal or low in patients with hypoventilation. The answer is any hypoventilation, one of the dictums is, you know, carbon dioxide will increase. If you follow this formula, as soon as the carbon dioxide is increasing, the alveolar oxygen will decrease. Remember, they are in an obligatory relationship. If patient cannot breathe out carbon dioxide, the partial pressure of carbon dioxide is going to eat up the space for oxygen. So partial pressure of alveolar oxygen is going to decrease. If this part of the formula is decreasing, naturally you cannot expect the gradient to increase. You cannot expect the gradient to increase, right? If the alveolar oxygen is decreasing, then whatever be the arterial oxygen, if this is going on decreasing, naturally the sum of this is going to be decreased, not increased. So you need to understand this idea that in patients with hypoventilation, the alveolar arterial oxygen gradient is going to be decreased or in the normal range. So we all know um, how to calculate. So this is the other, you know, the same thing that I've explained in the video about this concept in more detail, how to differentiate among the conditions where alveolar arterial, arterial oxygen gradient is increased. Like I'm telling over here that if you give oxygen and the patient's not improving by increasing higher FiO2, if there is no increase in the PO2, that's what we refer to as a shunt phenomena. Anyway, now there's um, little time for us to go into so much detail. Coming back to what I was just trying to tell, if you get this kind of a question, then if you remember the basic physio and if you even if you remember the formula that we that we discussed, I think this question should be very easy to answer. So in all these conditions, you can get hypoxemia, but the one condition where you find alveolar arterial oxygen gradient normal or low, the answer should be hypoventilation. A 60-year-old postmenopausal woman came with reports of a DEXA scan which showed a T-score of minus 2.5. She had a history of colis fracture six months back which was fixed. She is not a smoker, not, not alcoholic which is, which is correct about her further management. So what you can see over here is that this patient has features of osteoporosis. She already had a fall and a fracture so and the T-score is minus 2.5. So definitely this patient has to be on some treatment and if you look at the management of osteoporosis we all know that the first line treatment that we always start in patients is bisphosphonates okay so this is i think one of the easy ones that they have asked over here obviously we do use calcium vitamin d but they are not going to correct the osteoporosis and they are adjunctive treatments I mean they are additional treatments that you need to give the primary treatment is going to be 
uh, something that is going to decrease osteoplastic activity or increase osteoplastic activity, right? So the answer here is going to be alendronate. I'm sure you all are aware that hormone replacement therapy, um, uh, I still remember many years back, we discussed about this in the classes as a very, very, uh, you know, amazing treatment for postmenopausal females. But subsequently, I think even, I think it was almost 14th, 15th edition of Harrison, they came up with a number of things, studies showing that hormone replacement therapy increases the risk of cardiovascular disease, increases the risk of stroke. Um, overall increase in mortality it does decrease the risk of um, you know gi malignancies but other than that the the, the disadvantages are so many that um, you know overall it's not something that you would prefer unless there are very clear other indications so hormone replacement therapy generally is not going to be an answer you will choose in the exam repeat dexa scan after three years no in a patient who already has clear cut osteoporosis as you know osteopenia is a t-score of minus one and osteo between minus 1 and minus 2.5 sorry and beyond minus 2.5 is osteoporosis so this is uh, already having the t score plus the patient has a fracture which has occurred in the past so this all makes it obvious that the patient should be on a bisphosphonate in a 35 year old female grade 2 pulmonary hyper primary pulmonary hypertension the vasoreactive test was negative. Which of the following is the next step in the management? Now, these are the things that you should know about INICT. That, that's one of the reasons why in our classes, we emphasize so much about the recent things that came out. So you should know that the World Symposium, the you know six Symposium uh, happened recently and uh, they changed the definition of primary pulmonary hypertension. This is a topic that is... You know, charcha mein hai, we say, no, the people are discussing it and this is go it's bound to come. It came in the last INICT, it has come in this INICT, so it was expected topic. I mean, this is something that we know anything new that is coming everywhere, a lot of changes have happened, then it's bound to come in exam. So anyway, they didn't ask what we're expecting. What we're expecting was primary pulmonary hypertension definition. If you remember the primary pulmonary hypertension definition earlier was 25 millimeter mercury at rest. That was the cutoff level above which if the pulmonary mean mean pulmonary arterial pressure more than 25 was pulmonary primary pulmonary hypertension at rest this is what was the older definition the newer definition has reduced this now to 20 okay this is something that they might ask in the future so definitely remember this somehow they didn't ask this time but chances are good that they'll ask again and i think one of the reasons they may not have asked is because it is yet to come in the aha guidelines it has just come from the world symposium european aha guidelines are expected this year so i think that that's the reason why they're holding it but they'll they'll ask for sure now what is the management of patients with primary pulmonary hypertension the typical history is going to be a young female who might have family history of somebody who was um, who's passed uh, who had developed features of uh, you know dyspnea on exertion progressive dyspnea on exertion with more or less a normal x-ray so that's how they, they'll they'll give you the picture of a primary pulmonary hypertension now coming to the management of primary pulmonary hypertension once you make the diagnosis the first thing that you do is a vasoreactive test is it positive or negative if it's positive then the best drug is calcium channel blocker so always we always try to find out if we can use a safe drug that we have so much experience using an oral drug which is really very effective in a but unfortunately only in about 10 to 20 percent of population of primary pulmonary hypertension but if you can pick that up then they are, that's going to be the main drug main drug so we always take the patient for vasoreactive test remember the vasoreactive test cannot be done in outpatient it is a cat lab testing patient should be in the cat lab and there we give nitric oxide and we see if there is a drop there's a definition for that i think i've covered that in my classes so anyway you don't need to know the definition for vasoreactive test but if it's positive the treatment is going to be calcium channel blockers if it's negative broad concept is you should go for initial oral combinations and only in patients who have this is a grade 2 primary pulmonary hypertension in the patient who has got uh, breathlessness at rest that is grade 4 that's the patient you would like to go for that's high risk that's the patient you'd like to go for combination treatment that is parenteral so there you're going to do IV uh, IV treatment um, you know there are no uh, various techniques of how we are able to give some of these prostacyclin analogs um, um, delivery drug delivery devices are come but they're all parenteral but the first thing that we give in a patient with uh, grade 1 grade 2 is all oral drugs so the easy answer over here is ambrisentin anyway if you see I have summarized this in my notes, vasoreactive patients, calcium channel blocker, non-vasoreactive, obviously the answer should be clear, oral contraceptive, uh, oral drug, sorry, and in high-risk patients, you are going to go for prostacyclin and logs. This is the 
recent um, updates that have come so i've just covered it from there just picked it up from there what they're saying is if a patient comes to a primary pulmonary hypertension the first thing you do is a vasoreactive test if the vasoreactive test is positive then the answer should be calcium channel blockers if it's a non vasoreactive then you are going to look at if it's grade 2 to grade 3 then you are going to be putting the patient on oral drugs the oral drugs that we use are ambrisentin and tadalafil combination uh, or you can go for mesentin and sildenafil so basically uh, the oral drugs are the preferred ones when we are going to see patients who have got low grade primary pulmonary hypertension when the patient has got severe dyspnea on exertion or on uh, at rest the higher grade patients we are going to go for the prostacyclin analogs aproprostenil and the other drugs that are there so these are uh, the options we also have atrial septostomy as an option that can that can be done in some of these patients so we have covered the primary pulmonary hypertension knowing it was an important topic um, you know, because of so much discussion going on on this i think i've done it at de in quite detail in my classes so this should be pretty straightforward the answer is ambry sentin okay don't go for parenteral drugs the answer should always be particularly when they are taking tr trouble to tell you it's a grade 2 uh, primary pulmonary hypertension the answer should be an oral drug and this is um, the analog that we uh, you know that that is there um, endothelin receptor blocker for um, bosantin as you must have all be aware of bosantin this is the other one that is this this is ambrisentin okay endothelin receptor blocker so all the following are true regarding hepatocellular carcinoma sorry i'm just um, missing out on your questions yeah okay all the following are true regarding hepatocellular carcinoma except um, in recent times, so this is a question where um, I had uh, trouble collecting the choices. I think people had an issue with the recall. So we don't know whether this is a single choice question or multiple choice question. You should help me out in this. Uh, in recent times, there is an increase in cases of hepatocellular carcinoma. If such a statement had come, this is absolutely true. That yes, in the recent times, HCC uh, frequency is increasing. And if you actually see from 71 to 2010, I have got, but recently also you'll find that there's a progressive increase. And this is um, partly because of the increased risk of cirrhosis secondary to substance abuse like alcohol, also because of hepatitis C. So for all these reasons, and now even non-alcoholic fatty liver disease is um, adding to the inflammation, any inflammation, when you have steatohepatitis, inflammation, the steroid cells are going to start producing, um, you know, fibro fibrotic tissue and once fibrosis starts in and inflammation is there, then that is raw thing for hepatocellular carcinoma to occur. So yes, hepatocellular carcinoma does occur in this condition. It is increasing in recent times. These two statements are absolutely true. Now, the concept of levantinib and uh, the chemoembolization, this transarterial chemoembolization is broad concept you should know is that the chemotherapy that we talk about, sorafenib or levantinib, these are for patients who have got metastatic disease, for disease that is spread in, in these conditions, this is the main treatment. Whereas if you have a very small local lesion, then a chemoembolization becomes a very important treatment. The flowchart that is there for uh, the management of hepatocellular carcinoma, and these are the, the recent guidelines, I'll just show it to you, I'll just zoom in for you. And you can see that um, in patients who have got a very localized disease, Definitely, there is a role of salvaging, so we can consider liver transplant uh, in a patient who's got a you know stage A disease. When you're looking at stage B and stage C, now if it's a um, local regional treatment that we're talking about, then all this chemoembolization, radio frequency, all these things become very important. But once you are looking at a disease that is spread, particularly in patients who have got metastatic disease is there or it's refractory to local therapy then you'll find the systemic therapy becomes important and i'm sure this is the same thing that you broad concept all of you might be having about uh, chemotherapy once the disease is spread then local treatments will not work it's something that you hit broadly so sorafenib levan uh, lenvetinib lenvetinib these two are um, the first line systemic uh, you know therapies so i don't know what the exact choices were in this question from what i could understand um, they had given levantinib for small lesion which i think is incorrect levantinib is generally an important option when you have resistant to local treatment or patient has got metastatic disease that's when chemotherapy starts becoming important definitely chemoembolization this trans arterial chemoembolization is a treatment option for small lesions in hepatocellular carcinoma so i think this is a true statement this is a true statement this is a true statement this is the one that that we have a doubt in so you should help me out in in uh, suggesting 
Okay, one of the options uh, they are saying is levantinib is used in early cases, which is not correct. As you can just as we just discussed now, the lenalidineb sorry is uh, and sorafenib are options in metastatic disease or in stage C disease. So it's not early cases. Definitely, when the disease has spread, that's when this drug chemotherapy starts becoming important. So either way, if the choice was it is used in early cases, that is also wrong. If it's used in small lesions, that is also wrong. In general, this drug becomes important when you have advanced disease and we have metastatic disease that's when the chemotherapy becomes very important so um, again in these kind of questions when you are looking at a question and at first glance will hit you again this is a question that you have not don't have much idea about but if you start looking at the choices it will start giving you an idea about how to eliminate options I'm sure you all agree that hepatocellular carcinoma incidence is increasing bound to increase obviously because um, more uh, people you know, living more, uh, more alcohol, more viral hepatitis, more non-alcoholic fatal liver disease now added to that list with obesity and sedentary lifestyle. So naturally, HCC has to increase. We all know any inflammation, particularly state of hepatitis is going to progress to cirrhosis and hepatocellular carcinoma. So these two choices you could have easily eliminated. You're left between these two. And if you knew a simple concept that chemo is more for widespread disease, uh, I think that also would have helped you to localize towards what the answer is. So anyway, this is if the question is accept and this is the answer. If the question is multiple choices, you know which which statements are true and which statements are false. So depending on how the 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 framing is, I mean, if they're given A, B, C correct or A, C correct, I mean, I have not put those choices here. But now that you know what statement is true and false, I'm sure you can, you know, um, you can understand how the combination would have been. Okay, if uh, the Somebody saying TACE is used for locally malignant disease. Absolutely true. As I showed you, if that statement was there, that's a true statement because that's what it is. Okay, definitely for um, no metastasis should be there. For local regional therapy, definitely TACE is used and that too for small lesion. So if that choice was there, um, I would say that choice is true statement. Okay, that's a true statement. So all of the following are causes of splenomegaly except I think um, nice to see in between a few easy ones. So this is something that we keep discussing at length in our classes. Simple concept that when you're talking about uh, aplastic anemia, two areas they are repeatedly testing in our exam, aplastic anemia and ITP. Uh, these two conditions will not generally come with a splenomegaly. ITP may be still if you have secondary ITP, there are multiple things in ITP that you should be, that, that you should be aware of. Maybe ITP still is possible, but aplastic anemia is one thing that they repeatedly test in our exam will not come with a splenomegaly. So you all know um, in all these other conditions, lymphoma, leukemia, in all these conditions for sure you are going to get a uh, splenomegaly. Uh, aplastic anemia is a marrow condition. This is not a condition where you have excess production of cells which are getting destroyed in the periphery. So there's no reason why there should be a splenomegaly, um, you know, and the... Um, the repeat concept that we'll be discussing in our exams, if you pay attention to that, that typically in our MCQs, they'll ask you where splenomegaly doesn't occur. And the choice are going to be either aplastic anemia or ITP. ITP should be plus or minus, but aplastic anemia is for sure that that's a repeat question. A patient presented with a history of transient ischemic attack. Examination shows an irregular, irregular pulse. Echo is showing a severe mitral stenosis. The patient has atrial fibrillation. Which of the following is true regarding prevention of stroke? So in this, I think, again, this is the same thing that was tested last INICT also. In the last INICT video of my discussion also, I have covered this at length. And I told you that atrial fibrillation, um, you know, recent guidelines have come up and uh, this is a hot topic. And we discussed that in last INICT also in so much detail that in this condition, once you have a patient who's got mitral stenosis, uh, newer oral anticoagulant agents cannot be used. So two conditions they are saying you cannot, any patient with atrial fibrillation has to be on anticoagulation. Okay, aspirin alone will not work. Even if you use a CHAT vascular score, generally, you know, CHAT vascular score, um, you don't need to calculate in an exam because except for a score of 0 and 1, aspirin will not be, um, you know, option. So in most of the patients, when you got a stagnating blood, the blood will stagnate, it will clot. When the blood will clot, then you don't want that to happen and aspirin is going to work on platelets. It's not an anti-clotting drug. 
ओके स्टैगनेंट ब्लड इज ऑलवेज क्लॉटिंग सिस्टम फ्लोइंग ब्लड इज ऑलवेज प्लेटलेट सिस्टम सो आर्टरियल साइड प्लाक रप्चर्स एथरोस्कलॉटिक प्लाक रप्चर्स जनरल कॉन्सेप्ट यू नो वेन अ फास्ट फ्लोइंग ब्लड इज देयर एंड अ प्लाक इज रप्चर द प्लेटलेट्स विल प्ले अ रोल सो वी वॉन्ट हैव एंटी प्लेटेड ड्रग्स इन प्लेस ओवर देयर सो फॉर स्ट्रोक फॉर स्कीमिक हार्ट डिजीज प्रिवेंशन एसप्रिन प्लेज अ वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट रोल वेन यू हैव स्टैगनेंट ब्लड एनी वेयर देन दैट इज अ क्लॉटिंग प्रॉब्लम सो एंटी प्लेटेड ड्रग्स विल नॉट हैव मच बेनिफिट देयर सो एसप्रिन अ लोन इज डेफिनेटली नेवर गोन टू बी दी आंसर सो दिस फॉल स्टेट warfarin is indicated and this is the important point that we know for sure once you have atrial fibrillation patient should be on anticoagulation the important point is two conditions mitral stenosis and mechanical valve these two the risk was so high that nobody even used uh, novax in the trials in fact in the trials for novax these two conditions mitral stenosis and mechanical valve were were left out so because they were not even tested because the risk of formation of a clot and stroke is so high that new drugs could not even be tested on that so this is the reason why novax have not been approved for mitral stenosis again we discussed this last inict also not you cannot use novax for mitral stenosis you cannot use novax for mechanical uh, you know valve uh, post prosthetic valve that is so these two are um, you know newer oral anticoagulants like apixaban rivaroxaban dabigatran and they cannot be used so this is a true statement warfarin is indicated novax are not indicated that's a true statement and you know in the guideline for valvular heart disease once you have a patient with symptoms the patient should go for valve replacement of for valve repair so mitral valve generally is repaired whereas when you're talking about uh, aortic valve you need to go for a replacement so patient should be recommended for a mitral valve surgery definitely definitely that's a true statement okay once you have symptoms in a patient the patient should go for and that too they are telling you severe mitral stenosis so severe mitral stenosis symptoms these are the things that that are going to tell you the patient should go for a valve repair so the three statements that are true in this is b c and d so in this i think there is there is a combination that is there that is giving that kind of a thing so any anything else that you think that you need to add please um, let me know any any change in the choice but i think this is the question that people i mean i i, I checked with multiple students and i i think that this is how it came in the exam a 19 year old okay a 19 year old uh, presents with primary amenorrhea a uh, 19 year old female presents with primary amenorrhea on examination the breast development and secondary sexual maturation is normal axillary and pubic hair growth are normal so the important concept to understand is generally whenever they give you this kind of a question where they telling you secondary sexual characteristics are well developed that means the glands that are producing the hormones um particularly estrogen should be functioning normally that's the concept that strikes you when they tell you axillary pubic hair growth is normal it means that the androgen receptor must be functioning because even males or females the axillary pubic hair growth is dependent on androgenic stimulation Now you might say where the androgen came from in a in a female the adrenal androgens peak around puberty in a female and they are responsible for causing the growth of the um, you know the, that's why we call them adrenarchy so you know that you have telarchy adrenarchy then you have menarchy isn't it that's the that's the way how the sequences so anyway telarchy is there second sexual maturation is there adrenarchy is there means once you say adrenarchy androgen receptor defect cannot be possible okay testicular feminization is out of question here because there is growth of axillary and pubic hair you are seeing ultrasound is absent so typically in our exam you know when they are when they giving you this uh, breast development is normal you can easily rule out turner syndrome that's an ovarian problem when you have gonadal dysgenesis basically if you don't have a source of estrogen the breast development cannot occur so this is simple concept so when you have breast development occurring secondary sexual maturation of female occurring normally these two these two choices should be straight kicked out when they telling you adrenarchy is there androgens should need a receptor to work complete androgen in receptor insensitivity is out of question that is ruled out so this is nothing but mullerian agenesis which is nothing but mayer okitansky syndrome so mayer okitansky and complete androgen insensitivity actually look very very similar these two choices the basic differentiating feature is the presence of axillary pubic hair if it's there that's mullerian agenesis if it's not there it's complete androgen insensitivity which is also referred to as testicular feminization syndrome so the answer here is straight this is nothing but mullerian agenesis okay this is nothing but mullerian agenesis which the following is not true regarding siadh now uh, again this is a repeat it's come i think 
11 if i remember 2011 it was there it was there uh, i think few years back also recently anyway this is a frequently tested topic in our exams so when you look at syndrome of inappropriate secretion of antidiuretic hormone this is what we've covered in the class also when the adh is high it will act in the kidney on the v2 receptor to open the aquaporin 2 channels and cause water absorption anti diuretic hormone will not cause diuresis it will retain water so you are seeing water absorption occurring the water absorption one of the important things it will do is it is to some extent going to expand the volume and dilute the sodium to some extent the water absorption expands the plasma volume and that by feedback stretching the atria releases natriuretic peptides and natriuretic peptide natriuretic as you know will cause natriuresis so that will cause some sodium loss in the urine so urine sodium is going to be high now you might ask why is the urine sodium high in patients with sidh i would say there are two broad concepts why it is high one is there is release of anp which causes natriuresis that's one secondly whenever you measure any concentration of a substance it is basically relative to water so when you say urine sodium what you actually mean is urine sodium concentration is urine sodium to urine water ratio okay that is basically urine volume in 1 ml how much sodium is there when anti diuretic hormone is reabsorbing water back in the body it will concentrate the sodium it will increase the urine sodium so one of the repeat questions in sidh is they'll tell you urine sodium is low that's not possible when you retained water that causes the urine sodium to start increasing because sodium concentrates as water is reabsorbed back in the body urine sodium will be higher so this is the two main reasons anyway when you are retaining water you will dilute the sodium so this is definitely a true statement patient is euvolemic and at times hypervolemic because of retention of water urine osmolality is going to be high because you re reabsorb the water you concentrated the urine naturally urine osmolality is supposed to be high the correct answer here is urine sodium less than 20 so this urine sodium less than 20 if you remember exact same choice only one choice was different in the previous aims and that was instead of urine osmolality they had given water loading test can be done for diagnosis so our other three choices were same so basically they are playing around but the answer will not change the answer is urine sodium they keep asking on that so you should know urine sodium cannot be low in a condition where you are not diluting the urine it's not diuretic it's not diabetes insipidus this in this water is retained urine concentrated so this is the reason why urine sodium will be high so this is what we discuss in the class also it's a true hyponatremia it's a condition that comes with euolemia the urine sodium has to be more than 20 because normal in a normal person urine sodium is somewhere between 20 to 40 milligram per liter now urine sodium may vary based on dietary intake okay but normally any normal person urine sodium will be somewhere between 20 to 40 it can be higher if the person eats more sodium i mean orally it can be lower if the patient drinks too much water and that extra water dilutes the urine so urine sodium may vary but generally you will see in a normal person urine sodium is about 20 this is the reason why this 20 becomes important because 20 to 40 if you are taking normally normal people it can't be less than normal you understand the urine sodium has to be generally more than 40 in this conditions urine osmolality will be more than plasma osmolality because the main osmotic power is by sodium if sodium is decreasing in the blood or rather by water is diluting up the sodium then the serum osmolality will start decreasing and the urine osmolality will be high one of the peculiar features of this conditions is hypouricemia um that is mainly because of the v1 receptor and i told you water loading test if you give water any physiological adh that is there should get suppressed okay water intake should cause water loss in the urine so if you drinking water then adh should get suppressed if it does not get suppressed that confirms the diagnosis so these are the clinical features that you have of sidh and the various causes of sidh also we have covered in the classes anyway the answer here is straightforward the urine sodium is less than 20 is wrong it should be more than 20 milliequivalent per liter all the following statement this is another question where i had a lot of problem collecting the choices uh, any help you can uh, give me over here in telling about the choices will be always welcome um all the following statements are true except eeg is required for diagnosis of epilepsy definitely that's not a true statement we can make the diagnosis of epilepsy without eeg scalp eeg is used for diagnosis of frontal lobe seizures definitely that's a true statement so i don't know first of all whether it's uh, all except question whether it's multiple choices you should help me out in that okay in patients with progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy the eeg will show rhythmic spikes and diffuse slowing actually in patients with pml 
this diffuse demyelination of the brain this diffuse demyelination what it will do is it will cause diffuse slowing slow waves is what you're supposed to get theta activity delta theta activity is what you're supposed to get in pml now 20% of PML patients can come with seizures. So some residual spikes are possible. So rhythmic spikes to diffuse slowing, this is possible. But the classical thing is mainly just diffuse slow pattern. That's what you're supposed to get. Most of the neurons are damaged. So you're supposed to get actually slow wave activity. That's the correct pattern. Rhythmic spikes occasionally is possible. In different places, I've checked 5%. I checked, um, some places are showing. Some places they are showing 10%. So that definitely is a true statement that about 5 to 10% of patients, normal people can have some spike activity. When you say epileptic activity, what you mean by that is in the EEG, compared to the background, if you see some sharp waves or spikes, they are referred to as epilept epileptogenic for us. If you find that activity standing out in the background of a normal activity, if you see the sharp waves or spikes, that's called epileptic activity and that can occur in normal people also. So in this, that means um, if... I had to choose one i would say the best answer is eeg is required for diagnosis but as i said um i'm at a loss with the recollection i mean there seems to be some recall error over here anything you can suggest feel free to tell if it is uh, which is true then um, in all these i would say the best answer is choice d i think 10 percent of normal people have epileptic, epileptic activity seems to be a fair statement that's fine okay again the scalp eeg if they instead of you know, scalp EEG is used for diagnosis. If they say it's diagnostic of frontal epilepsy, that makes this choice incorrect. You understand? Just diagnosis, diagnostic. That will become an extreme statement. And extreme statements are always wrong in medicine. You know that. So how they play around with the words based on that, the answer will change. So um, any anybody can add. If they ask which is correct, last choice is definitely correct. 10% normal, normal people have epileptic activity. That is correct. People who have epilepsy may have a normal EEG. People who are normal may have an EEG that is abnormal. That's the point that you need to understand. So EEG is not the best tool. It cannot be used for screening. It's not that great in the in the in the diagnostic purposes. So it just got some limited role. That's the point to remember about EEG. Okay, patient is hypoglycemic. You can get, get a lot of abnormal activity, and then that looks like epileptic. So that the point that you need to understand is can normal people have some epileptic activity in the eg the answer is very much yes now that we are talking about the um, third option correct now okay in progressive multifocal encephalopathy actually typical pattern is going to be because of diffuse demyelination you should get slow wave pattern theta activity is a classical activity the classical picture you see in pml is slow wave activity now rhythmic spikes don't know whether that um, you know uh, it's not the classical feature of PML anyway. It's a plus or minus statement. So I don't know whether it's a... So you all, you all agree that means that this is a single best response they had asked, not multiple choices. If they say all accept, then EEG is required for diagnosis wrong. If they say which is the best statement in this, that is true, the answer is choice D. 10% people, normal people have a predicted, that's fine. 5 to 10%, it varies in different books. Some book is saying 5%, some books 10%, that's fine. Is EEG is mandatory for diagnosis of epilepsy is definitely wrong statement. If they say EEG is mandatory for diagnosis of epilepsy, I would say that now only we're saying it's false, then I'd say it's thousand times more false. Means it's mandatory for epilepsy cannot be the answer. I mean, rather it's an incorrect option. Okay, if it's a single best, then I, we are not sure about the choices. Um, so don't confirm anything in this. Unless we have the proper choices, we cannot conclude. Looking at what we have right now, if they say which is true, this is definitely a false statement. Okay, so looking at all these, I would say, see the problem in frontal lobe is actually it's a very difficult uh, seizure to diagnose. This is what we refer to as pseudo seizures, right? This is, they actually refer to as pseudo pseudo seizures. They actually seizures, but many times we mistake them as pseudo seizures. That's why they call pseudo pseudo seizures. And diagnosis with scalp EEG is very, very difficult. It's possible, but it's very difficult. In that also we do something on high density EEG, we do. And that also is something that is a recent, that is, that means typically scalp EEG doesn't make the diagnosis of frontal lobe. Uh, seizures so this is kind of more tending towards false this is very much false this question this is plus or minus you know I don't know what the exact wordings of the choice were ideally the characteristic finding is a slow wave pattern so just to give you a few points about the eeg see eeg um um the concept behind it is really very amazing um when you put the scalp electrodes uh 
what you get is the activity that is there mainly the pyramidal uh, you know cells are the ones that contribute to the main activity the problem is ki when initially they started testing um, the eeg and the hans berger that's he, that was his name the person who invented eeg uh, when he put the electrodes he realized that unless he amplifies these electrodes by multiple fold you cannot uh, you know pick up the electrical activity either that or he has to open the skull and put the electrode directly on the brain so problem is when you amplify something you really increase the amplitude then you increase the sensitivity like so crazy that even the earth uh, electrical activity will get captured the any surrounding activity that is there that also gets captured to overcome this problem they came up with a very brilliant idea and that brilliant idea was that whatever electrical activity is captured by this electrode and this by by this electrode because you are amplifying and any noise that is there in the environment can get introduced in it to overcome that they came up with a brilliant idea and that is that between these two whatever electrical activity that is different will be captured only the difference will be captured uh, uh, i'll give you a very easy thing see when you look at i remember in in you know as children we used to see in the newspaper two images and they used to tell spot six differences between the two okay you have image a image b spot the six differences between the two images something like that over here what is happening is ki if this activity and this activity is same they'll cancel each other you get a flat line so in that also we have multiple things you have unipolar you have bipolar okay so many things are there which it by itself is a class but the general concept you should understand is ki we look at differential activity the difference between the two will get recorded if it's outside thing that is interfering it will interfere here also it will interfere here also and it will get neutralized means that will not be captured to overcome outside interference this was the idea that they capture only differential activity by capturing dif differential activity the outside whatever electrical you have a phone that is there that should also interfere because you are magnifying so much the sensitivity so much that whatever wiring is there that electrical activity also should have normally interfered it doesn't interfere because it's going to be picked up by both the leads and that will get cancelled only difference between these two waves will be recorded and that's what is happening that's how you get the typical eeg recording the eeg leads that we place uh you should have a general idea about uh, the way how we place the eeg because they can ask simple questions on eeg in our exams all numbers that are even numbers are right sided leads all numbers that are odd numbers are left sided leads okay odd numbers are left sided leads even numbers are right sided anything that is zero is midline okay so frontal zero central zero parietal zero anything that is z zero means it is in the midline so midline and remember the more away it is the bigger the number so you got Four, you got eight. Eight is more bigger number, so more away from the center. So more away from the center, the bigger the the number for the for the electrode, and even numbers are all right side. Odd numbers are on the left side. So they they give you an EEG. Wherever you see any abnormality, look at the side. Is it even number or odd number? If it's even number, it's a right side a problem. If it's an odd number, that's a left side problem. How we place the electrode is known as the ten twenty rule. This ten twenty rule is between each two electrode, we got a twenty percent area. and this is because each person's skull size will vary so we don't use the centimeters we use percentage so what happens in this is ki from the nesivion and the neon we got 10% that is extreme ends we have 10% but between every other electrode there's a 20% gap so it is known as 1020 rule when you're recording in the um, electrical activity obviously uh, eeg has a very important role to pick up epileptic activity and epilepsy is synchronized firing of all the neurons imagine if the neurons over here and the neurons over here both are firing exactly in the same frequency they will cancel each other because don't forget what we are recording is differential activity so it will show a flat line so when you have a flat line and there is a uh, you know activity above and below it then the point where you have flat line and above and below you have opposite activity like if you have a positive wave over here you have a negative wave remember eeg is opposite of sorry okay is eeg is opposite of ecg ecg upward wave is positive uh downward wave is negative that's in ecg here the downward wave is considered positive and upward wave is considered negative so anyway you see opposite polarity over here so all these will help us to tell where the epileptic activity is occurring 
an epileptic activity simply where synchronized neurons are firing somewhere in some part of the brain that you can pick up by this technique you also have something called bipolar system this is bipolar and then you have unipolar the highest amplitude tells you where the activity is that is known as unipolar so unipolar bipolar and all is something that you don't need to go into too much detail broad simple concept that i just told you if you understood till now that anything that is starting with odd number so you got odd number odd number odd number so this is all occurring on the left side anything that is even number even number even number even number even number all this is right side so these are right sided leads these are left sided leads they are involving fronto temporal means they are in the front then you have the occipital area that means occipital means the more they are more backward they are, they are more the leads are that are more behind so wherever you see see this is normal activity you can make out when you see normal activity you can see in that something called sharp waves sharp waves and spikes are what is abnormal for us this sharp waves and spikes compared to the routine background that is occurring you can see it stands out it tells you there's something happening over here this is a patient who is not right now having a seizure but he had a seizure at home now he's coming to you you're seeing residual firing somewhere its spark is occurring that is setting up the seizure so you pick it up and you come to know that there's a you know uh, opposing polarity happening here there is a flat line in between so you know this is where the lesion is if you trace this this is basically t4 okay this is where it is it is t2 t4 t2 t4 means what it is temporal lobe t2 t4 means what right or left right so this is right temporal lobe epileptic activity very classically seen in patients who develop temporal lobe epilepsy so patient right now doesn't have epilepsy remember epilepsy doesn't sometimes most of the times rather it occurs not in front of you the patient had the epilepsy now he's come to you or rather he had the seizure now he's come to you you test now what you're getting is this and once you have this then you know that this patient has got an epileptic activity occurring in the right side in the temporal area so you think this patient might be having a temporal lobe sclerosis mesial sclerosis that might be responsible for the temporal lobe epilepsy in this patient so this is how the eeg is useful this is how um, the you know the eeg is Uh, helping in localizing where the electrical activity is there in that also there is lot of depth obviously you have generalized activity you have lateralized activity in that there is something called periodic waves are there so there are multiple ways how we classify the eeg activity and then we study it but i hope up till now you just have a general idea about the basic questions that they ask that they might ask in our exam on eeg uh, this one i think uh, was a little tricky because of the particular choices but other than that i think um, i hope you have an idea now about what what are the electrodes how we put the electrodes and how we study now there was one choice about progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy as you all know that is nothing but uh, the jc virus jc virus is ubiquitous is there in the environment any condition which causes gross immune suppression in the brain particularly will activate this virus and you get this disease called progressive multifocal as the name is telling multifocal means diffusely leuco means white matter encephalopathy so white matter pathology so it's a diffuse white matter pathology that occurs diffusely all across the brain it occurs in severe immunosuppression so it's very classical in hiv in advanced uh, disease like aids it can occur in conditions where you use drugs like natlizumab which cause strong immune suppression of the brain by blocking the blood brain barrier they don't allow immune cells to cross natlizumab and that's why the immune cells are not there so it's kind of an immune suppressed state that's why in um, natlizumab you get progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy so the cells involved here are oligonucleotides um and that is basically astrocyte swelling and oligocent oligonucleotide dysfunction these two result in the patient developing demyelination so there is a diffuse white matter lesion it can affect other areas also jc virus but as i told you it's a ubiquitous virus is there in the environment so moving to the next one again this is a question i think um the this set of question that we are seeing now are the reasons why i am ten, tempted to tell that this time paper was not that easy um i think it was a little tricky a look at these choices and i think it was not fair on their part to ask questions which had so many values um i mean i don't know what they are expecting and i don't even know whether this is a single response question or it's multiple choices anyway let's go through the choices when you look at heart failure first of all you should know heart failure can be classified into heart failure with reduced ejection fraction and heart failure with preserved ejection fraction so the reduced ejection fraction if you look at the classification so okay less than 40% ejection fraction we are telling it's reduced more than 50% we say preserved 40 to 50% we say mid range you know heart failure with mid range ejection fraction so we have 
थ्री नाउ हार्ट फेलियर विद रिड्यूज रिजेक्शन फैक्शन वेन द इजेक्शन फैक्शन लेस दैन फोर्टी परसेंट हार्ट फेलियर विद प्रिजर्व रिजेक्शन फैक्शन वेन द इजेक्शन फैक्शन इज मोर देन फिफ्टी परसेंट ओके मोर देन फिफ्टी परसेंट लेस देन फोर्टी परसेंट इन बिटवीन विद वॉट वी रेफर टू एज अ मिड रेंज इजेक्शन फैक्शन ना ऑल दीज थ्री आर हार्ट फेलियर ना हार्ट फेलियर फ्रीक्वेंसी इज इंक्रीजिंग ऑल अक्रॉस द वर्ल्ड एंड पर्टिकुलर इन डेवलप कंट्रीज दिस इज वन ऑफ द लीडिंग कॉज वन ऑफ द इंपॉर्टेंट कॉज ऑफ डेथ एज यू ऑल नो स्कीमिक हार्ट डिजीज इज द टॉप किलर मोस्ट ऑफ अगर नॉक द बकेट थ्रू स्कीमिक हार्ट डिजीज रूट एंड हार्ट फेलियर ऑब्वियसली इज अ प्रॉब्लम दैट दे आर टेलिंग विद द नेक्स्ट थर्टी ईयर्स द अमाउंट ऑफ हार्ट फेलियर केसेज इज गोट सिग्निफिकेंटली इंक्रीज ओके नाउ नॉन कार्डियोस्कुलर डेथ इज मोर इन यू ऑल मस्ट हैव हर्ड दिस जनरल आइडिया दैट हार्ट फेलियर विद रिड्यूस्ड इजेक्शन फ्रैक्शन इज मोर वर्स देन हार्ट फेलियर विद प्रिजर्व इजेक्शन फ्रैक्शन दैट मिथ वॉज ब्रोकन नाउ दे आर सेइंग दैट द मोर्टेलिटी रेट एक्चुअली इज सेम द रीजन इज कि मोस्ट ऑफ द प्रिजर्व इजेक्शन फ्रैक्शन डाई ऑफ नॉन कार्डियोस्कुलर डेथ एंड हार्ट फेलियर रिड्यूस इजेक्शन फ्रैक्शन मोर ऑफ कार्डियक डेथ अल्टीमेटली यू विल सी द मोर्टेलिटी इज सिमिलर इन बोथ ऑफ दैम सो रिगार्डलेस ऑफ द टाइप ऑफ इजेक्शन फ्रैक्शन this is absolutely true statement the fire mortality is around 54% to be precise actually so they giving around 40 50% that's a true statement so this is definitely a true statement okay non cardiovascular death is more common in preserved ejection fraction compared to reduced because reduced they'll die of cardiac causes mainly so this also a true statement okay ac inhibitors cough 15% injury edema now injury edema is 0.1 to 1% and cough the problem is different studies are showing between 5 to 30% so 15% seems to be correct so you cannot deny this choice it's actually a true statement now here's the problem in elderly patient atrial fibrillation are going to be about quarter of the stroke cases responsible for quarter of the stroke cases i think there's a problem in this statement it looks like uh, in elderly the occurrence of stroke is more than one third in the sense of all the stroke cases more than one third of them actually they are saying might be because of atrial fibrillation above 65 years remember this is not true for below 65 above 65 the you know earlier we used to think that stroke um um you know many patients who got admitted with stroke we used to put them on there was a study where they put them on halter monitoring for atrium and they found that a big chunk of people who we never thought their pulse was normal at admission in with stroke but they ended up having atrial fibrillation which was paroxysmal episodes of atrial fibrillation we knew about paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardia but paroxysmal afib is also now a problem and that's one of the reasons why that that is responsible for the stroke cases so this is not quarter this frequency is far far higher so this is a false statement So they ask you a single best response in this. The answer is definitely choice D. In elderly, AFib is constituting much much higher number of stroke cases. Overall stroke cases, most of them you will actually end up, even though they might not be having AFib at admission in the hospital, but the trigger for that clot that has formed in the heart must have been an AFib that must have occurred somewhere earlier. Okay, proximal episodes of AFib. So anyway. If it is multiple choices, I told you which statement is true, which is false. If it's single best response, now you know what, how to, you know, approach this question. Mortality more in reduced than preserved. Mortality more in reduced than preserved. That is a wrong statement. Okay, if they say mortality more in any of the two, that is wrong. See, look at the data. First of all, you need to understand why this topic is in charcha is because 2021 they came up with ESC guidelines for diagnosis and treatment of heart failure. Now this is an entire booklet. They completely changed lot of stuff in this. The biggest change I'll tell you is they added SGLT2 inhibitor. SGLT2 inhibitor was for diabetic patients. Now they're telling even non-diabetic patients you can use SGLT. to any better so the flow chart that they are giving now i'll show you but these are the changes that have come in heart failure now recently and what the important changes are i'll just tell you in a minute but this is the reason why this topic is important now because heart failure uh, the last one if you remember was 2014 after 2014 now 2021 they have come up matlab ab charcha mein hai sab log baat kar rahe hain iske bare mein to ab to synapses mein it's it's hitting it is going to come in the, in the exam and i won't be surprised if the questions come in the coming neat also on heart failure So what the studies are showing? If you look at this study, 2014, a very large study which showed that the um, almost 50% of all heart failure cases actually are the heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. So frequency-wise, if you see overall, you'll see that green one, the green thing that you're noticing, all this is heart failure with preserved ejection fraction compared to heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. So recently, this is the trend now. Heart failure with preserved ejection fraction seems to be increasing compared to what we saw in the past. now that myth that was there no that preserved ejection fraction is slightly better than heart failure with reduced ejection fraction that has gone now they are telling the mortality is same okay approximately 50% of all heart failure admissions that are for preserved 
the mortality is equal to heart failure reduced fraction fraction and i'll just zoom in for you look at the graphs that they have got over here all cause mortality all cause rehab or re hospitalization almost all of them you will find that they are they are ultimately similar now the only difference is ki the thing might be cardiovascular death might be more in patients with reduced ejection fraction okay but ultimately overall mortality if you see regardless of why it is occurring if you don't see cardiac cause or non cardiac cause overall mortality if you see all cause mortality you will find that they are almost very similar okay so reduced ejection fraction you can see the lines almost going neck to neck with each other so the the mortality rates are supposed to be equal so that is the heading also here preserved ejection fraction similar outcome to heart failure with reduced ejection fraction so what is changed in the heart failure reduced you we all know that in preserved ejection fraction heart failure with preserved ejection fraction we don't have proper treatment guidelines still okay nobody really knows what to do over there the only thing that might be asked is now there is one study recently just last year they came out suggesting that in heart failure with preserved ejection fraction sglt2 inhibitors what we were using in diabetes canagliflozin empagliflozin they are showing some benefit in this condition so that is one hope that is there now but since these are they were for diabetes earlier now using for heart failure and the studies are ongoing but that looks like it is showing some benefit otherwise in preserved ejection fraction all you do is correct the underlying problem hypertension you correct that patient has got atrial fibrillation you treat that whatever problems are there you treat other than low salt diet and lifestyle drugs as such are not there really that we can that that are showing that there are showing a change in the outcome or change in the mortality but reduced ejection fraction we've got a lot of drugs you all know arni arni is basically angiotensin receptor and neprolysin inhibitor so this arni angiotensin receptor neprolysin inhibitor is basically a uh, secubitral and valsartan combination that is the preferred option now arni it's called okay angiotensin receptor neprolysin neprolysin inhibitor that is nothing but secubitral and valsartan that is the preferred drug and if that is able to control along with that we can add diuretic okay those are primary treatment for chronic heart failure apart from that what drug to add they are now saying that okay okay so if the patient fulfills the condition then one of the first drugs you will introduce apart from arni and diuretics uh, that is furosemide is aldosterone antagonist so aldosterone antagonists really are showing mortality benefit but the criteria should be fulfilled the potassium should be less than 5 the creatinine should be less you know not very high um, the gfr should be more than 30 so so you they're looking at everything creatinine should not be more than 2.5 so looking at those things also once that is done then you can look at the next one that you can add and that is sglt2 inhibitor sglt2 inhibitor now whether diabetes is there or not there these are anti diabetic drug correct but they are now really very important for as per the new guidelines in heart failure and they are become almost right on top you can see arni mineral corticoid receptor antagonist and sgl t2 inhibitor almost third in line then then after that you have the other diuretics you can add and finally you, there is a role of adding hydrolyzine in patients hydrolyzine is particularly in african american and indians in caucasian in whites it will not work and ultimately if the heart rate is more than 70 uh, then you can add ivabradine ivabradine is never going to be first line it's one of the last drugs you add particularly if the patient's heart rate is above 70 so this is the management the new uh, flow chart that given for heart failure with reduced ejection fraction and is very recently it's come out now it is trending meaning chances are pretty good that in the coming exams neat and the other exams maybe even next inict uh, this 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 area will be tested chances are very high on that so so coming to the choices um let me see what some of you are suggesting how can we remember all these numerical values i agree rohan it's just not possible but you're supposed to know the general idea that wrong, a lot of wrong things we used to believe earlier you're supposed to understand that that is not true in the sense earlier we thought reduced ejection fraction is more worse than preserved ejection fraction now they're telling reduced ejection fraction preserved ejection fraction both of them are equal unfortunately there is not much we can do in the treatment and overall mortality rate is around 50% in both of them by 5 years so that that is a that is a major wrong concept that has been corrected by recent things that's what they are testing in exam you don't have to remember all these values you need to understand that what we thought earlier preserved is better than reduced that's not true because preserved if they don't die of cardiac they die of non cardiac so ultimately the mortality balances 
mortality rate regardless of who i told you this idea already that it will be 50 percent in five years that's a true statement okay you're supposed to know you did not remember the values but the concept you should know key preserved and reduced now both will have a mortality which are very similar one may have more cardiac one may have more non-cardiac but ultimately outcome is similar in both now then comes the ac inhibitors now if any choice you see this kind of choice things you know ac inhibitor cause 15 percent cough one percent angioedema this kind of things i would say you can actually consider these are true i mean they are they are not very high this is ac inhibitor we know is a known cause of cough this is one of the reasons why we use angiotensin receptor blockers angioedema one percent doesn't look very high i think this is a kind of statement you can say even if you don't know the exact percentages you can say okay this seems to be fairly okay now in atrial fibrillation again this is a new concept you cannot remember the percentages i agree but the recent things is they're telling that apple watch and all that is coming up now gadgets that are coming up that are picking up the irregular irregular pulse warning the patient that they have afib otherwise they would never have known that they've got afib actually now patients are a lot of them are coming with stroke and now we're understanding that much of the stroke was hidden afib which we never knew they had and the atrial fibrillation is considered to be causing a pretty good percentage of stroke cases overall above 65 years so above 65 uh, some of these gadgets might might play a role in the future to decrease the risk of stroke so you may not know the numbers but the general concepts this broad idea is what you you'll remember in the exam specifics you will not know in the exam even the topper who's come who's going to get a first rank he will not know any of these percentages amongst you but he'll have a general idea about what are the recent things that are happening and if he knows that and if he's attended our classes our discussions we'll bombard we'll keep telling this this you know this stuff if you pay attention to that i think that should that should be good enough Okay, you may not know what are the recent things happening, what are the new studies that have come, jo kaun se charcha mein hai, that's our job. I mean, that's the reason why we suggest ki you listen to the live classes, not the, even the pre-recorded ones, obviously, but then the live classes will be that year. I mean, they are covering the, the stuff that is happening. Resistant hypertension is defined as when BP control is not occurring with the use of three drugs. So basically, you have used three antihypertensive drugs. Despite that, BP is not controlled then that's when we call resistant hypertension. We discussed the treatment plan of hypertension now as per the new guidelines. The main frontline drugs are A, B, C, D. Isn't it? This is what we discussed. In this, we discussed this very important concept that beta blockers should never be. A is AC inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers. B is beta blockers. C is calcium channel blockers. D is diuretics. Okay, so these are the drugs that we that are antihypertensive drugs that you're supposed to use. The front line are these. In that, they have removed beta blocker from the first line option. So now you have A, C, and D, AC inhibitor and or or angiotensin receptor blocker. These are your drugs, isn't it? Now in this, in this, when you say resistant hypertension, they are saying that among all these to tell resistant hypertension, ideally patient should be on these three drugs only. AC inhibitor is there, CCP is there, diuretic is there. Despite that BP not control, you will tell resistant. In fact, before telling resistant, first of all, you will check whether the guy really is taking the tablets compliant or not. In our country, most of the cases that we say resistant, actually they may not be resistant. Simply patient did not take the drugs. So compliance is a major issue most of the time in practice. But in MCQs, you will see that this is the definition anyway. Now, in that compulsorily, they are telling one point. When you say resistant, the patient better be on a diuretic. If the patient was on a diuretic, plus the patient was two other drugs, totally three drugs he was taking, still BP not controlled, then you say that this patient has got resistant hypertension. Now, you know that alpha blockers, beta blockers, alpha methyl dopa were nowhere anyway, not there in our first line list at all. They were not, we were not even considering them anyway. This choice, I think, easily could have been eliminated because in the current hypertension guidelines, they don't, they don't have central role. They are not the, you know, main players. They have a role when patient has some other disease, add-on drugs we are using, they have a role over there, but primarily for essential hypertension, they are not the first line drugs. So you covered about the role of, um, you know, what things will reduce BP, weight reduction, how much it will reduce, DASH diet, how much it will reduce. This we've covered in the class. We also discussed about the pharmacotherapy. Okay. And you should know that this is again CMDT 2021. You can see the definition of resistant hypertension defined as failure to reach blood pressure control despite patient taking three drug regimen, which must include a diuretic. 
ओके डिस्पाइट टेकिंग द डायरेटिक प्लस द टू अदर ड्रग्स पेशेंट स्टिल हैज बी पी नॉट कंट्रोल दैट्स वॉट वी डिफाइन रेजिडेंट हाइपर टेंशन नो दे वॉज डेफिनेशन फॉर रेजिडेंट हाइपर टेंशन नेक्स्ट टाइम दे कैन आस्क यू ट्रीटमेंट यू ऑल नो द ट्रीटमेंट फॉर रेजिडेंट हाइपर टेंशन इज अ मिनरल कॉइट रिसेप्टर एंटागोनिस दैट इज स्पेनल लैक्टोन स्पेनल लैक्टोन शुड बी यूज इन पेशेंट्स हैव गॉट रेजिस्टेंट हाइपर टेंशन स्पायरनो लैक्टोन Remdesivir mechanism of action. So I think this is a pretty straightforward one, and um, we've discussed at length in our COVID videos. Um, you know, and the only thing that new that is coming up is now uh, molnupiravir. I think is uh, hot, and it's pretty good chances it will come very soon. So molnupiravir, I think, is pretty showing pretty good results. Um, then. Uh, the vaccine associated thrombosis still is an issue they might ask in the exam um, which we have covered you know uh, in the in the previous um, you know recent doubt clearing sessions and all that so many places i have covered about vaccine associated thrombosis anyway uh, this is a question that they have asked in a simple one and what we are now understanding is ki the idea that you know they ask a lot of questions on covid may not really be true but they are asking a few questions and ult ultimately until everything is properly established in covid up till now all the studies that we have we don't have meta analysis significantly we do have a few studies but nothing really concrete so once it starts becoming concrete and you know guidelines are coming out then i think more questions in the covid can be expected in the future a patient with cirrhosis presents with ascites and pedal edema for mobilization of edema what is the preferred diuretic in this um you all know the first line treatment in patient with cirrhosis and ascites and edema has to be spironolactone now spironolactone is not there in the choice but definitely epilidinone and spironolactone are very similar except that epilidinone is more expensive drug and slightly more safer but it's more expensive we use spironolactone mainly because it is much more cheaper and is what was studied in the in the in the studies but definitely epilinone is a good option over here now i have seen some people go too much in the wordings of the question they said ki sir ye mobilization of fluid tha na isliye mujhe laga ki the better answer is furosemide now if you read the wordings in harrison also they are suggesting the same thing ki you have to start the patient on a mineralocorticoid receptor antagonist first furosemide is just an add on drug and the dosages can be increased if you want to mobilize more fluid that's different but the first line is this only and i don't think the answer will change uh two furosemide simply because they have used mobilization of edema fluid that sentence is there i don't think the answer will change so i think the answer should be a mineral quarter chapter antagonist still so okay as per the isdp um the single step testing for um oral uh, for gestational diabetes the fasting glucose cut off is is 92 so this is um all numbers and unfortunately they should not ask these things but cannot help it anyway this is the international association for study of diabetes in pregnancy and um, this is a single step testing that they are recommending and the values that they are giving are for fasting it's 92 1 r is 180 and 2 r it is 153 Okay, so these are the values. Unfortunately, um, the ADA is endorsing. That means American Diabetic Association is accepting these guidelines. That's the reason why I think they might have asked. But still, they are numbers, and unfortunately, we are still getting numbers in a zone in an era where we are all carrying Android iPhones. Num numerical questions should not have been asked. But anyway, that's the unfortunate uh, truth of the exams in India. eye hand coordination is mainly coordinated by which of the lobes in the brain and this uh, simple uh, concepts we discussed that when looking at the occipital lobe obviously you know vision is in occipital temporal lobe is connected with the memory spatial orientation all the spatial orientation is done by the parietal lobe now you need to understand broadly we talk about something called what tracts and where tracts when you look at a where tracts where is it located in the space <laughs> that's all connected with parietal it's occipital parietal tracts look at where tracts what don't forget when you see something if you tell what it is you should have a memory of it first so memory is you all know temporal lobe so what tracts when you talk about these are known as the what tracts okay what is it to recognize the object that occipital lobe has to consult the temporal lobe which is memory this is what is seeing what is seeing what is memorized combination will tell you what it is where it is spatial orientation 
and everything in the space arrangement that we talk about is all special so these are known as the wear tracts so eye hand coordination as you can understand spatial orientation we're talking about that has to be parietal okay this is all space orientation we're talking about this is parietal okay if it is what tracts then we're talking about occipital temporal so this is parietal lobe that is mainly involved okay space everything connected with spatial is all parietal lobe in hepatitis B vaccine, which of the following is a subunit? This, I think, was a straightforward one, and it is the surface antigen. That's why those who are vaccinated will be having surface antigen, um, you know, antibodies. A 60-year-old patient presented with fatigue and lymphadenopathy. The smear showed smudge cells, which is straightforward. This is nothing but CLL. And they're asking in a CLL patient, what's the next first investigation you'd like to do? The answer is get a flow cytometry. Okay, whenever you see a peripheral smear showing features suggestive of CLL, next step you have to go is get a flow cytometry. Okay, main thing you're focusing on is it, uh, what is it having combined B cell, T cell marker? And your main point to differentiate from mantle cell lymphoma is whether CD23 is positive or negative. So CD23 should be positive here. CD5 should be positive with a T cell marker. CD1920 T cell B cell markers. So B cell T cell combined marker on the same cell will get you the diagnosis that this is going towards CLL. A boy presents with fever, night sweats, neck swelling, starry sky pattern, which is straightforward. And you all know that this is basically C mic. You know, buckets lymphoma translocations. This is 814. This is 2.8 and 8.22. Notice in this 8 is constant and 8 is basically the oncogene that is CMYC. Rest of the lymphoma is very easy. We know either it has to activate the heavy chain or the light chain. You know that 14 is the heavy chain part of the antibody. 2 is the light chain and 2, 22 is also light chain. So one is kappa, one is lambda. So light chains 2 and 22. Heavy chain is 14. One of them has to be activated. That's how you get the malignancy going. So CMYC is the oncogene. So whenever you're studying in pathology translocations, try to find out each chromosome, what is the oncogene and what is it activating. If you get that idea, then based on that, you'll be able to remember in the exam and you'll not get confused. Okay, somebody asks you suddenly, uh, follicular lymphoma, what's the translocation? Or mantle lymphoma, what's the translocation? The numbers in the exam, see, whatever you read on the day of the exam, a large chunk of it will evaporate and much of it will create confusion. So that confusion Fusion, if you want to avoid, then you need to, you know, um, narrow it down and get a handle on each chromosome is connected with what, then, then you will not forget in the exam. The lab report of a patient showed the following, surface antigen negative, HBE antigen negative, IgG anti-HBCIG positive, IgM anti-HBCIG negative. Now, this is, I think, pretty straightforward. To tell chronic hepatitis B, surface antigen has to be present. Once you say surface antigen is negative, then this cannot be a chronic hepatitis B patient. It cannot be an acute hepatitis B patient. Acute and chronic hepatitis B, surface antigen is the main thing. It has to be present. It's not there. They are out. In a core window period, we are talking about antibody against surface antigen and surface antigen. Both should be absent. This is not a core window period because here you're seeing that they are negative. Okay, surface antigen is negative and you're saying IgM is also negative. The point is core antibody, remember, will come with IgM. Okay, I've seen some students ask me, sir, why not the answer is core? The answer is not core because for, okay, this is patient having surface antigen. This is a patient who's got antibodies against surface antigen. And the main antibody that you're supposed to get is IgM anti-HBCAG. So in the, this is the window period. So in the core window period, neither will you have surface antigen, neither will you have antibody against surface antigen, but you should have IgM anti-HBCAG. That's negative. It's not IgM, it's IgG. In IgG means chronic, you cannot get core. You cannot get core window period at that point. Core window is going to come with IgM. So this is definitely out. The answer is simple. This patient is recovered. Once the patient recovered for life, after that, he might have IgG anti HBCAG positive but this is a patient who's recovered from it this is not a vaccinated patient vaccinated will not have IgG he'll have antibody against surface antigen I hope you understood this idea so recovered patient he's recovered from it don't forget acute hepatitis B 95% recovery rate only 5% of them there's a risk that they might progress to chronic hepatitis B so once they have recovered, what's the only antibody they'll have? They'll have IgG, anti B, CAG. How can you tell this is not chronic hepatitis B? In chronic hepatitis B, surface antigen has to be positive. So we've discussed this in our uh, classes. This is what you can see in the notes also. When you say core window period, remember the patient should be IgM, anti B, CAG positive. So that's not, this is not core window period. 
this patient has recovered and this is what we discussed recovered patient antibody against surface antigen and IgG anti HBCIG anyway they're not mentioning antibody but they have mentioned IgG anti HBCIG without surface antigen you consider that this patient has recovered which had um, but what is used in the acute treatment of a cluster headache now here is again one more big headache headache question and this is another headache question that they're asking in the exam. Now they're giving choices of oral somatriptan which you can easily eliminate. You know cluster headache is going to be very severe, it's going to start up suddenly, so oral is going to be out of question. You're left with subcutaneous somatriptan and you're left with oxygen. Okay, somatriptan and oxygen. Now between these, what is happening is, ki if you're talking about oxygen, oxygen has a role at 12 to 20 liters per minute. Okay, it is having a role at 12 to 20 liters per minute. For that, you need a non-rebreather, high flow oxygen mask. Normal thing that you have, you know, just uh, nasal thing, you can't, you have to have a high flow non-rebreather mask and you should give it high rate, 12 to 20 liter. Then it is effective, not at six, not at eight. Anyway, this is what you see in CMDT. Um, I think this CMDT and Harrison, this Harrison first and what Harrison is suggesting, the patient should be given 100% oxygen at 10 to 12 liters per minute. Okay, somatriptan 6 milligrams rapid in onset will also actually work and it will work in 10 to 15 minutes. At this point, you might say, ki 8 liter or 10 liter mein kitna farak aagya? Matlab, do hi hai na? To thik, I'll answer the oxygen also is equally good. Why are you saying somatriptan? I'll tell you why I'm saying somatriptan. Okay, I've done all my homework. Anyway, this is the prevention of cluster headache. One is the acute treatment. Then the other is to break the cycle, you give steroids and verapamil. Long-term prevention, you use verapamil, topiramate, lithium. All these are basically prevention of cluster headache. Acute management, I hope you all understood now. It's going to be subcutaneous, sumatriptan. You also have nasal triptans that can be used. Anyway, they're not given that. But the point is subcutaneous, sumatriptan, very effective. Auction, very effective. Auction, they're giving it 10 to 12, which is not there in the choices. Now, I'll tell you why I'm choosing the answer. I'll just show you, then you can tell for yourself. Okay, and again, I agree with you, this is not very fair, that they've asked in an article that's come out in this year, this 2021. Okay, this is about comparison between auction and, I'll just show you first of all the article. Okay, so you can see, first of all, this is 2021. This year it's come out. Effectiveness of medication in cluster headache. They've done a thorough comparison between auction and somatriptan. So I agree with you. It's not really fair for them to ask um, choices where they are giving you auction values and, um, um, you know, the dosage of the drug and asking in the exam. I agree it's not, rare, not fair, but, but this is the reason why we are saying that it's not such an easy paper overall anyway coming back to what i was telling uh, effectiveness is given as dark blue little effect is supposed to be the light blue color and the very light one there's no effect okay no effect you notice comparison in the efficacy first of all read the points here efficacy of three medications under investigation auction somatriptan zolmitriptan and this also auction they are giving at 12 liters okay 10 to 12 liters so not uh, one that they give an exam six and eight liters will be less effective even less effective than this so based on this you can make out clearly efficacy of auction is much lesser than triptan triptan efficacy is very high compared to zolmitriptan uh, nasal spray subcutaneous somatriptan is the best among all these more studies they have done what if the patient is a smoker what if the patient is um, you know female i mean they've looked at different different things almost every where you'll see the efficacy of somatriptan is much more than auction and zolmitriptan okay even with different dosages they have given so if you if you're keen you can read up this article so ultimately the conclusion you get in among all these three the most effective seems to be uh, subcutaneous somatriptan and i think um, because this article is coming out now it's no wonder that they were asked in the exam also so my choice among these should be subcutaneous somatriptan. Sorry about this. Where is it gone? So if you look at the choices again, um, 
I'm sure based on what we just saw, it does look like the answer is subcutaneous somatoptan. If they're given the dose six milligram, then all the more sure I would say that they are expecting you to they they are expecting you to answer this. Definitely, oral uh, triptan are uh, efficacy wise very low, and in cluster which starts suddenly severe headache, definitely not the preferred option. You're going to choose between these. Between these also, I would say you can clearly rule out. You are going to test your thing between these two high flow oxygen and uh, somatoptan in that high flow oxygen also they are saying it should be non rebreather mask it should be 12 to 20 liters per minute not really 8 or 6 liters so i think based on the amount of oxygen also d will not be the answer um so i think i would go for based on the article plus i've seen other references also my answer would have been subcutaneous somatoptan uh, you are free to differ obviously so yeah because of the uh, numericals because of some of the recent studies based on that they have picked up and asked uh, i would say yes there are some questions which are and don't forget also that maybe the very difficult ones people are not able to remember at all and it's not even come in our hands mother we don't even know maybe there are some choices which the questions which which people may not have been to you know remember at all but as i said when the paper is tough um, there are a few percentage of questions that will be very very tough but that will be tough for everybody Broadly, your ability to reason out on the day of the exam, the fact that you are able to get the concepts, like the question on TAPVC, we discussed at length in our classes how the, you know, foramen novel is going to be patent in TAPVC, what is the fetal circulation, how the mixing happens. If you understand those things, then that saturation question can be easily answered. Even though saturation questions, you know, pullback catheter saturation question should not come for post -MBS. But if you know the concept in TAPVC, I think that was a straight question. I'm sure most offers would have got it correct. So my point is that there are some concept-based questions that they have asked this time. If you are logic, if you are logical, if you are concept-based, I mean, concepts are clear, you could have answered those. If you have read our notes in detail, like primary progress of multiple sclerosis, orsalizumab, for example, or most of the other things, I mean, most of this stuff, you'll see a significant number of them. I showed you the references from our notes only, and I think it was... I mean, you can't skip anything in the in the notes, in the, particularly the live class notes. Um, I think they are really to the point. And in the classes, we will emphasize ki this. This is new. This is something that, you know, like multiple sclerosis. Sure, I'm sure I would have told in the class ki primary progressive. There was no treatment for so many years. Now new drug has come. It's an important topic. It's an expected question. So anyway, uh, I think we have covered um, um, whatever I could. Um, if there is anything else that is left out, feel free to ask. Otherwise, we'll we'll end over here. So, again, um, as I keep saying, every question here, the answer might significantly vary based on the choices. So, if you recall some other choice, then obviously the answer is liable to change. So, the based on the question that I have, this is the answer that I thought was correct. But as I said, the answers are once point in the statement changes the answer is going to change so either way take this as a learning um, phase and uh, this is it from my side um, thank you